Joe Biden visits Pennsylvania and he trips over his tongue about a thousand times when he's not lying through his teeth. And we'll give you all those gory details. Plus, we know now that Alejandro Mayorkas will not actually face an impeachment trial, but he faced today what may be even worse. Tough questionings from Senator Rand Paul and from Senator Josh Hawley. It's great stuff, and I can't wait to get to it. If my voice holds out, I sound like I swallowed a frog. Doesn't matter. We're brought to you by Electronic Payments Coalition. I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. Everyone's telling me, my, my voice, you said, voice sounds fine. Your voice sounds fine. To me, it sounds like this. In my head, that's what it sounds like. Thank you for joining us. We're live right now on Rumble. I love our chat friends. We got a lot of lengthy videos today to work with, especially the questioning of Alejandro Mayorkas uh, by Rand Paul and Josh Hawley. So I'll be interacting with our team there watching live on Rumble. So make sure you start chatting and I'll chat right back during some of those video clips. But we're way busy with our first round of clips. Joe Biden went to Pennsylvania. He wants to win that state. He needs to win that state. And of course, he's from Scranton. So he went to Pennsylvania to meet with the regular folk. Of course, the only reason he went there was because he was getting a big money endorsement from union bosses, the steel union workers decided to give him an endorsement it was a big moment for him the mayor and i are buddies i told the mayor and i mean it sincerely the first outfit ever to endorse me as a 29 year old kid running in a tough year for united states senate make me the second youngest man ever elected to the senate was a guy named Huey carcella and back in those days still we had a big steel workers we had a lot of steel workers in claymont delaware where i was from because they worked in Worth Steel Company. And uh, and I'll never forget coming to me and saying, we're going to get your help. And I came out to Pittsburgh and, and Steel Workers endorsed me. It changed everything. Changed everything. Yeah, it's a great story. You know, listen, we used to have a lot of steel factories in Delaware. That, of course, until I got elected. And then me and my party, we ruined the economy for the manufacturing base. And now it's all credit card services and banking and insurance. And you steel workers can go fly a kite doesn't matter but but ah, i love you guys love you guys but it's, it's a sweet story it is here he is getting the big u.s steel workers endorsement from big union bosses the workers themselves don't like him but the union bosses like him because he throws a lot of benefits their way and they're gonna you know get out the vote and strong arm their membership and try to force them to vote against their will but it's a warm and wonderful story first union ever to endorse him for any elected office when he ran for Senate back in 1972. Isn't that great? Very sweet story. Too bad it's a complete and total lie. Because just a couple of months ago, he got this endorsement from the UAW, and he told them the exact same thing. Just want to let you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with uh, our entire international executive board, and uh, we wanted to call and let you know that we've met, and we decided it's time to endorse you for president. And we're All gonna put right. The UAW membership behind you. Whoa. You were the first outfit out there, endorsed me when I ran in 1972 as a kid. You helped me out then. We so he's just a liar. It's the exact same story. He Does he think that we don't know this? Does he think that there aren't cameras running? He probably doesn't even remember that cameras have been invented, to be honest. So back in 1972, the UAW was the first union to ever endorse Joe Biden except when the U.S. Steelworkers endorsed him, and then they were the first union to ever endorse Joe Biden in 1972. Then he took to the stage, and he had two different events. We're going to show you clips from both events because, well, they're hilarious and also terrifying that this man continues to keep the nuclear codes and can launch a war at any given time. One day I showed up at off your convention, and I was in... Uh... I was in the motel at the local motel getting changed after the afternoon session, go back to the evening session. I'd come down with some young activists, a little older than me, but still young activists who uh, were uh, involved in trying to reform the party. And uh, I was in one of those eight by 10 bathrooms, you know, they have shower, toilet in the sink. And I got a towel on me and shaving cream and I heard bam, bam, bam at my door really loudly. And uh, wondering what the hell is that? I thought it was this guy, Bob Cunningham, on a radio show, and a couple of the guys. So I said, okay, okay, guys. And I walked to the door and opened it up, and standing there 
was the former governor of the state of Delaware, Albert N. Carville, a big guy, about 6'5", talked at you like he is. And the state representative who got defeated four years earlier as a Democratic state rep who was retired and one of the from the family that had more more senators appointed than any other family in American history to the tunnels and a former retired justice and the, and the state chairman. And they said, I'm standing in a towel shaving cream on my face. Now, I would love to tell you exactly uh, what the point of that story was with all the very vivid details about all of these cronies that he used to cozy up to, to stay in elected office. Cause you know, that's what Democrats do, especially in Delaware, one of the most corrupt States in our country with the most corrupt democratic party apparatus, you know, all the, I love that he's bragging about all these cronies that he knows or knew because they're all dead by now. I would love to tell you the final point of the story, why Joe Biden needed to ramble on and on and mumble barely audible to this audience of captives because they're forced to be there by their union bosses to hear how he greeted somebody at the door of a hotel room wearing nothing but a towel and shaving cream on his face. But there absolutely was no point. It never reached any sort of anything. This is just a rambling, incoherent man. Who, who I think thinks he's telling stories to the friends at the retirement home. But it got worse. Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the nephew of a man who was eaten by cannibals. That's, that's the headline we got yesterday. As Joe Biden began to tell stories about cannibals. He started on the tarmac uh, between one of his stops in Pennsylvania. Ambrose Finnegan, I'm going to call him Uncle Bozy, he, uh, he was shot down. He was on the Air Corps before there was an Air Force. He flew single engine planes, reconnaissance flights over New Guinea. He had volunteered because someone couldn't make it. He got shot down in an area where there were a lot of uh, cannibals in New Guinea at the time. They never recovered his body, but the government went back when I went down there and they checked and found some parts of the plane and the like. And what I was thinking about when I was standing there was when Trump refused to go up to the memorial for the veterans in Paris, and he said they're a bunch of suckers and losers. So he ends this vivid story about his uncle being eaten by cannibals in New Guinea with a lie about Donald Trump that has already been debunked multiple times about saying something that he never said about veterans. But let's just roll back for a second. So his his uncle, Uncle Bozy, is flying reconnaissance in New Guinea, gets shot down where there are cannibals, and they never recover the body, suggesting that Uncle Bozy was dinner that night for a bunch of natives in New Guinea. By the way, if you're Joe Biden's ambassador to New Guinea, what kind of job do you have to do today to clean up this freaking mess? I assure you the president doesn't blame you for this, and he doesn't actually think that you people are cannibals. Now, strangely, like two hours later, he told the story again in Scranton. Why is he telling reporters on the tarmac in Scranton this story, by the way? Anyway, Joe, the reporters are already going to vote for you. Don't worry about it. They're already on your side. So then he goes, and now since you've already heard this story, he's going to tell it again. But I want you to watch the faces of the people who are literally forced against their will to stand up beside behind him and hold up a sign. Because it's painful to watch. Back in when D-Day occurred, and on Sunday, the next day, my mother's four brothers all went down to the recruiting station and joined the military. Every one of them volunteered. And my uncle, they called him Ambrose, they called him, call him Bozy. My uncle Bozy was a hell of an athlete. They tell me when he was a kid. And he became an Army Air Corps before the Air Force came along. He flew those single engine planes as reconnaissance over war zones. He got shot down in New Guinea. And uh, they never found the body because there used to be or a lot of cannibals for real in that part of New Guinea. 
And, uh, and then my son volunteered to go to Iraq for a year, and he came back with stage four glioblastoma. And, and, they, and they gave, like many of you, risked your lives, and you know people who gave their lives to the country. They're heroes. But one of the things that I, as I was doing that today, I was reminded. Yeah, and then he goes on to tell the lie about Donald Trump, and it's like, it's all they've got. It's all they've got. But he's got to frame it with this story, which, have we heard this before, exactly? About Uncle Bozy, Finnegan Bozy, Finnegan. I like his name as Finnegan. Uh, and the fact that he was eaten by cannibals. You would think that that would be something we would have heard about by now. And now he's telling it to RNC counted three times, three times in a 24 hour period. Did he tell the story about his uncle shot down or crashed for some reason in New Guinea and then eaten by cannibals? Uh, can't be true, right? In fact, it is a lie. The military, the Defense Department at the time, the Secretary of War, they never said that he was eaten by cannibals in any way whatsoever. But of course, the media now, they're doing all of the hard work for him. Look at NBC News. God bless him. President Biden mischaracterizes the circumstances of his uncle's death. Mischaracterized it. He didn't lie. Oh, he's not lying. That's not a lie. He's merely mischaracterizing the circumstances of his uncle's death. Associated Press. Biden is off on the details of his uncle's World War II death. Yeah, he didn't lie. He was just off on the details, guys. As he just claimed that his uncle was eaten by cannibals. That's just a slight detail that he was off on. Come on, give the man a break. Meanwhile, of course, he's trying to relate himself to Scranton because he always tells you he's from Scranton. He's the boy from Scranton. He was from Scranton. My mom lives in Scranton. My dad lives in Scranton. I live in Scranton. I'm from Scranton. And Scranton, Scranton, right? What about your mom in Scranton again? My mom didn't live in, in Scranton since she was 1954. But... Oh, well. Okay, her mom lived in Scranton, but only up until the point she was 1,954 years old. That's what you said. My mom lived in Scranton until she was 1954. My mom didn't live in, in Scranton since she was 1954. Since she was 1954. But that's all right. It doesn't matter because Scranton is in his blood. Scranton is in his DNA. Scranton is the very fiber of his being. He's all about Scranton, right? My grandfather would tell me when I walked out the door in North, Scr North, 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 Scr in North Washington Avenue in Scranton. Yeah, it's it's so natural for him to talk about Scranton that he can't even pronounce the word anymore. Well, because he's a senile old fart. Okay, then things got to because this would all be funny. And it is funny because we should laugh at this guy because he's going to get us all killed. But then he was asked a question about Israel. He was asked a question about Israel. And of course, he was met with protesters outside all screaming in favor of the Hamas terrorists, because that's his base. And then he said this about his efforts in diplomacy with Benjamin Netanyahu to make sure that the war didn't escalate. He wants to make sure that they don't move on Rafah, which is a city in Gaza. Here we go. And I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. It's just not, I mean, anyway, I, I just, look what we did recently when israel don't move on haifa he says haifa is a city in israel it's part of israel it's it's not in gaza it's not in any palestinian controlled territories haifa is actually i think the third largest city in israel and joe biden warned the israelis not to move on haifa warned them not to move on their own city and I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. I, by the way, I'm offended by the notion that this guy picks up the phone and calls Prime Minister Netanyahu and dares to warn him and make it clear to him that Netanyahu can't move on any city that he damn well pleases, assuming that he meant Rafa. But then you should be offended that he doesn't even know, know the basics. Do you think this is the stutter working again? Is that the problem? This is just the stutter. And I made it clear to Israelis, don't move on Haifa. It's just not, I mean, 
it, anyway, I, I just. We are so. F can I say that? You can bleep it later. This is the advantage of watching the live stream on Rumble. We're. F and then there's this. Now, this is the end of his speech in Scranton. And we're going to show you what he does. But can you take a look at his face, please? Look at the dead eyes. You know, people always, he's always wearing those Ray-Ban sunglasses because he's so cool that he wears the aviators. No, he wears the aviators so you can't see how dilated his pupils are because he shot up with Ritalin or God knows what. What kind of fentanyl-laced cocktail that keeps him up and around for a speech like this. Look at those eyes. Look at the cold, dead, drugged up eyes. His brain is shot. And now watch him maneuver what should be one of the easiest things a human being ever has to do. Walk off a stage. Here he goes. Hold your breath, everybody. He has no idea where he is. He has no idea where he is. He has no idea where he's been, and he has no idea where he's supposed to go. But listen, none of that really matters ultimately. What matters is the people of Pennsylvania, the people of Scranton, the people who are struggling right now with the economy there, uh, in the steel industry and what have you. So NBC News wanted to find out what the voters are really thinking about. So let's see how Joe Biden's message resonated with the good people of Scranton and the people who work in the steel industry in central Pennsylvania. In Scranton, Trump supporter John Vasiliga is building a new restaurant and he's slamming President Biden for rising costs. He says his policies are better for, for middle America or anybody. Just walk around and ask the real people. They'll tell you the exact opposite. Oh, well, now hold on. That's not fair. That's just that one guy's a restaurant owner, so he's probably a a fascist capitalist pig. He doesn't represent the real people. So let's go to the streets. Let's just see how the turnout was with the regular people of Scranton coming out to see the president's motorcade. People love him. Didn't you hear that? I mean, they got the name wrong. They were all cheering. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. It's Biden, guys. That was that was let's go, Brandon, wasn't it? I couldn't make out all the words. And thank you. That one very vociferous gentleman there who was saying, you're number one. He kept saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? I think that's what they were saying. I feel like I work at NPR all of a sudden the way I'm spinning this. Remember how I mentioned he wears the aviators everywhere so you can don't see the dead, dilated pupils in his eyes? Well, they made an impromptu, not very impromptu, stage stop in a Sheets, because nothing says Central Pennsylvania like a Sheets. I like Sheets, actually. I go, what do you like better, Sheets or Wawa? Kevin, you got you, you to gotta chime in on this. That's like the big, it's like a, a Whataburger versus In-N-Out, and of course the answer is In-N-Out. But what about Sheets or Wawa? What do you like? Well, as a native Virginia boy, I feel obliged to say sheets, but I know you Maryland people, you more New England folks like your Wawa. I'm not a New England folk. Wait, Maryland is not New England. And also anything, I'm a anything man. north of DC. All right. Well, I, I do. I actually, I like sheets too. I think sheets has the better food, to be honest with you. So I'm going with sheets there. You happy now? You, you, you rebel, you confederate. All right, so he, stop, he stops in his sheets and take a look. Of course, he keeps the Ray-Bans on inside. But watch the overwhelming response of the people there inside the sheets. Oh, 
All right, it's just too painful. It is too terrifyingly painful. Did anybody even care? You had one person trying to get a picture with him. Did you see him as he approached the little girls there? And it was almost like his inner monologue. You know, somebody's told him, Joe, you got to stay away from the little girls at these things. It's just really creeping everybody out. Watch him approach the little girl. Oh, look how excited he is. And then the voice in his head, don't do it, Joe. You'll get in trouble. Don't. Nope, stop. Don't. All right, I'll move on. All right, I'll move on. Oh, and look, here's some 14-year-old girls. I don't, don't look at them. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. I think one of those Secret Service guys, his whole job is to keep him from going after the girls. Can we just quickly juxtapose that against last week's visit by Donald Trump at a Chick-fil-A? Uh -huh. <laughs> More houses is more than the office. Right? I don't care what the media tells you. Uh, okay, 4 p.m. Look at 4 p.m. Come here, let me give you a hug. <laughs> 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 kind of a different scene there from when Joe Biden walks into a uh, walks into a sheets. The people love him. By the way, we're not the only ones to notice there's a slight difference between how just regular people are greeting. Joe Biden versus how they're greeting Donald Trump didn't take the Trump campaign long to create this video ad. Crowds gather in upper Manhattan as former President Trump visits a bodega. So this is the moment Mr. Trump arrived tonight. People lined up along 139th and Broadway as he made his way inside the Hamilton Heights bodega to meet with Jose Alba. Alba is the bodega worker who fatally stabbed the man in July of 2022 in a case of self-defense. On Tuesday, he used a Harlem bodega as a backdrop to slam Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg for being what he calls soft on crimes that matter. Without a doubt, very much supported here in Harlem. I, I really appreciate the sound of the 1200 baud modem dialing up there too. It's it's a nice little touch. Well done. Well done, Team Trump. You know, millions and millions of Americans enjoy their credit card rewards. Corporate megastores now want to take those rewards away. These are rewards that we use on groceries and school supplies, uh, cash back that we earn to save on gas and grow our small businesses, airline miles and uh, hotel points that we use to uh, travel places and gift to our family members so that they can come travel and visit us. The Durban Marshall credit card bill would eliminate those credit card rewards. It's outrageous. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help corporate mega stores line their pockets, American families pay for it. So tell your senator to oppose the Durban Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com. You'll learn more about this bill so you can be an informed voter. And then you'll see tools right there so you can inform 
your senator and take action today. That's handsoffmyrewards.com, handsoffmyrewards.com. Now, as you probably know by now, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats all linked arms and decided to just dismiss the impeachment articles that were brought against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. They're not even going to have a trial. They will hear no testimony. They will see no evidence. They're just deciding, nope, everything's fine. And uh, listen, good for you. Glad they did that on two accounts. Number one, every single Democrat senator running for re-election now must answer for this. They need to go back to their states and explain to their citizens, their voters, their taxpayers, their victims of crimes, why they're just fine with Alejandro Mayorkas violating the law and our basic national security protocols that he is sworn to uphold and why they're okay with him lying about it under oath, where for the last three years in Congress, he has assured the American people through their representatives that the border is secure. It's up to every Democrat senator now to explain why they're just fine with that kind of behavior. That's the first reason why it's just, just absolutely fine that the crooked criminal Democrats decided to not even take this up. The second reason it's fine is when Donald Trump wins election this November, if the Democrats have a majority or if they can put together enough of a consensus with uh, never Trump Republicans, if they ever bring impeachment articles up against Donald Trump, now the Senate knows what to do with it if we've got a Republican majority in the Senate. Now we know the precedent is set. Thanks for that nuclear option. But Alejandro Mayorkas is not completely off the hook. He was appearing in the Senate today at a committee hearing on Homeland Security. And it didn't go well for him when he's actually forced to answer for his policies and the repercussions of his policies. Here is ranking member on the committee, Senator Rand Paul. Secretary Mayorkas, Senator your administration, the Biden administration, over a million people have been paroled. What is the criteria you use for uh, paroling individuals? Uh, ranking member uh, Paul, uh, the parole process um, is one that we um, execute according to the law. We make individualized determinations with respect to a significant public benefit or an urgent humanitarian reason. So what reason, for what reason was the alleged killer of Lake and Riley, Jose Ibarra, paroled and um, allowed to come into this country? Ranking member, um, Paul, uh, first and foremost, all our hearts break for the family of Ms. Riley. Secondly, the perpetrator of this heinous criminal act needs to uh, meet justice to the fullest extent of the law. And I will not comment on the particulars of the case because the matter is being prosecuted uh, by authorities now. This isn't on the case of whether or not he murdered her. This is on the case of why you paroled him. Why was he paroled? Yeah, real fast there. This is a really important thing and you're gonna hear it revisited. So I just wanted to jump in here. This is him just trying to get away with not answering questions. They do this all the time. I'm not gonna comment on an ongoing case. No, this has nothing to do with the murder. This has nothing to do. Th this happened a year before the murder took place. This has to do with you letting him in the country in the first place. That's not going to be involved in the murder investigation. That's a, you commenting on how he got into the country, how you let him in and let him stay will have absolutely nothing to do with the murder case. So answer the freaking question, you bald freak. But he'll keep doing this and it's going to drive you absolutely insane. And the reason they do this and the reason they dodge the question and come up with these fake phony answers that they just keep repeating over and over again is because A, they are so arrogant and entitled that they know they're going to get away with it because the Democrats, not only in the Senate, but in the media will let them get away with it. And number two, because they hold you in such contempt, they get off on this. They get off on this. They get off on having this power and knowing that there's not a damn thing you can do about it, and they know how pissed off you get about it, and they love it. It's part of why they do this. All right. My same answer, Ranking Member You're Ball. refusing to answer the question? I have provided my answer, Ranking Member Ball. You're refusing to give any specifics about Jose Ibarra. Well, I have the documentation, and the document says that the, parole, the subject, the person ac accused of killing Lake and Riley, was paroled due to detention capacity. It was full. 
So is detention capacity uh, statutorily allowed to be used as a reasoning for parole? Uh, allow me to assure you that individuals who pose a public safety threat or national security are our highest priority for detention. The reality, not just with respect to this administration, but every administration that precedes me, is that the number of encounters has exceeded the number of detention beds available. The question is, is it statutorily, legally allowed to use the excuse that our camp is full? He was paroled due to detention capacity. Is that allowed under the law? Um, uh, Ranking Member Paul, my a prior answer stands. Which means you're not going to answer the question. Are you pleading the Fifth Amendment? No, Ranking Member Paul, I've answered the question. That well, well we, no, you haven't. It's the, the question is very specific. You have testified previously and you have testified today that there are two reasons you can be paroled, urgent humanitarian need or significant public benefit. That's not the reason listed. The reason listed is parole due to detention capacity. Is parole due to detention capacity a lawful reason for paroling someone? Uh, Ranking Member Paul, there are there are different bases for parole. Um, I am not a legal expert in this regard, but let me assure you that when an individual is encountered at the border um, and they um, are deemed to be, at the time of encounter, a threat to public safety or national security, they are a priority for detention. If not, they receive a notice to appear and are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings. The number of individuals encountered at the border exceed the number of beds available in our detention facilities. That is not something specific to this administration. That is something that has if been they, true. You might for, have more beds if they remained in, in Mexico. Uh, did the administration, when you came into office, reverse 92 executive orders of the Trump administration, which allowed them to apparently have people remain in Mexico, allowed them to have, you know, probably 90% less parolees than you have. And so when you come to us and you say, oh gosh, if we only had more legislation, we could do it. Why, do, why don't you uh, bring back the executive orders of Donald Trump that seem to be working? You, you immediately got rid of them for political purposes the border's a disaster. Why don't you bring back the 92 executive orders that you reversed? I respectfully, um, uh, Ranking Member Paul, disagree with the premise of your question. That's because you refuse to look at the facts. And uh, it's still, you know, I guess insulting to all of us and insulting to the memory of Lake and Riley and to the memory of others who have been killed by people who came into this country. March 2nd, an illegal alien who got into the country as a gotaway killed Washington State Trooper Christopher Gadd. Haitian man who entered the U.S. via the CHNV parole program was arrested for sexual assault of a 15-year-old girl. March 21st, illegal aliens in El Paso rushed the fence. You saw that on national television. An illegal alien on March 23rd murdered 25-year-old Michigan resident Ruby Garcia. Chinese national came across the border and illegally breached a military base in California. I mean, the stories go on and on. And I think a lot of people in America are going to be appalled, you know, that you refuse to answer the questions. Um, Jose Ibarra, you know, is it, was it lawful to parole him? Was it lawful to let him in the country? Uh, because you say the camp's full. Uh, ranking member, uh, Paul is a, uh, a former federal prosecutor for 12 years. I can say with tremendous conviction that individuals who commit uh, criminal acts need to be held accountable for their crimes. Well, that's not much consolation if you wait until after he's murdered somebody. See, part of the problem is, and I think people would be aghast to know this, that when you come in, you just give people your name, right? It's the honor system. There may be some databases you check, but certainly most of the domestic crimes in Venezuela probably are not in any kind of international database. So if you waltz into the country, through your generous parole programs and say, I'm John Smith from Venezuela. You have no way of ascertaining that. And you still let them go. So you say, well, we're going to make sure that they're not a violent criminal. You have no way. You look in some databases, maybe they're not in the database, but you have no way of even knowing that that's their name. Then you give them biometric. You give them, you know, you, you, you give them uh, fingerprints. Now they have a new name and fingerprints. They essentially have been given a new identity by your agency. 
I don't know. I, I'm just so sickened and sad by the, the families that have lost loved ones from this. I don't see real remorse. I don't see you're willing to answer the questions. I mean, if it were me, I would be so upset by this. I would be doing everything possible to make sure that another Jose Ibarra doesn't get in. But apparently you let his brother in, too. And his brother's got a rap sheet 10 times longer than Jose does. And so, I don't know. All I can express is disappointment and bewilderment that the Democrats let you get away with it. Larry, you're muted. You're muted, Larry. Yeah, I muted myself because I was coughing a little bit there. Sorry. Rand Paul is disappointed. He said, how about some white hot rage, right? Why, 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 why not express a little bit more than just disappointment in Alejandro Mayorkas here and his department? Uh, I'm glad he delved into that at the very end there, though, because I'm so sick of hearing Mayorkas and all the members of this administration, whenever Lake and Riley or any other victim of their negligence is brought up to them. You saw this with Karine Jean-Pierre too. Before I say anything else, let me just say how deeply saddened we are and how our hearts are broken for the family that they've had to endure this. Shut up. Don't tell me how sad you are. Own what you did and then fix the freaking problem. I will no longer allow Alejandro Mayorkas to sit there and wring his hands and say, we are all so upset about what happened to Lake and Riley while he continues to support the policy that let that happen to Lake and Riley in the first place. And when you've got a kid and they're doing something stupid in the house and they break something, it's not enough for them to just say, well, I'm really sorry. I mean, they have to say they're sorry, but they also have to fix their behavior so it doesn't happen again. And by the way, a little punishment sometimes goes a long way. This guy gets no punishment, none at all. And the beginning part of that, uh, by the way, the beginning part of that testimony is incredibly important too, because they were asking, it got a little dry, but I want to lay it out for you. They asked about the parole policy. You know, they're letting people in legally with quotation marks, upwards to 30 or 40 or 50,000 a month under a parole program. Now, listen, more than that are coming in. They're coming in illegally or they're coming in on asylum. But they're utilizing this thing that was set up called parole that allows the discretion of the Border Patrol through the Homeland Security Department to allow people in and they get paperwork because A, there's a dire emergency or B, they are bringing such incredibly important skills and and qualities to this country that we don't want to have to turn them away. So, yeah, come on in. Or sometimes, like, let me give you an example of the emergency. If a, if a woman is like got attacked and raped at the border and she's like suffering from injuries or something. And the border patrol agent can use their discretion to say, okay, come on in, we'll give you medical assistance. That's, that's what these have been used for in the past. Pregnant woman comes to the border and she's in labor. Okay, fine, come on in. Of course, that baby becomes a citizen and there's a whole domino effect there, but, but you get my point. Now, this administration is using that parole because, well, we've got so many beds in our shelters that we just got to let people in and send them to New York. That's not an emergency. They've created that situation. They've made it so. And that's an incredibly important part policy-wise of why this guy needs to be punished and impeached. And Democrats, again, stood in the way from keeping it ha from happening. Now, in a second, if, if you want to see more of that, you're going to be really satisfied with Josh Hawley. Because as as technocratic and challenging as Rand Paul was, and he was, and he did a very good job. Josh Hawley, well, he brought the heat. And you're going to be very satisfied when you see it. And we're going to bring it for you in just a moment. First, though, you know the financial experts expected us to have a nice interest rate decrease. We were hoping to get federal interest rates and lending rates down maybe six times this year. But then in February, the interest or the inflation numbers came in and much higher than normal, so no interest rate. March numbers just came in. Those are also higher. We're going to be lucky to maybe get three, maybe two interest rate drops this year. What does all that mean? Inflation's going up. We keep printing money that we don't have. Interest rates are still screwing up the real estate market and other investment opportunities. We are in a huge financial crisis right now, especially with regard to your savings. 
If the dollar is not worth as much as it was three years ago, that means your retirement accounts are not worth as much. Even if on paper, they look like they are because those dollars don't go as far. What do you do in a situation like this? Well, you need to protect yourself. You need to diversify. So you've got investments for the future that aren't beholden to interest rates and inflation and stupid decisions politicians make. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation. And Birch Gold Group actually makes it incredibly easy to own. What you want to do is talk to them and they'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And you don't pay a penny out of pocket for this. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They've got thousands of satisfied customers. You can trust Birch Gold. So give them a call. Actually, don't give them a call. Just text them, actually, because that's all all the cool kids are doing. They're texting. Text Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, to 989898. You're going to get a free info kit on gold. And then you'll talk to a precious metal specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Once again, just text Larry. That's my name. That's the name of the show. It's a name of the one of the Three Stooges. Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, to 989898. Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri had his chance with Alejandro Mayorkas on Capitol Hill today. And this is something to behold. Take a watch. Senator Hawley, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let's just come back to Jose Ibarra, if we can. You know who that is. That's a question. You know what he did? I know what he's accused of doing. Which is? Um, uh, murdering a young woman. And that wasn't the first crime that he committed in this country, was it? Um, Senator, as I've articulated previously, I'm not going to speak about the facts of the case because there is an ongoing criminal investigation. Have you read his parole file? Um, Senator, a same answer. So you're not going to say whether or not you've read the parole file? I've got it right here. Have, have you read this? Uh, Senator, I do not want to speak to the particulars of the case, given the pending criminal uh, See, prosecution. Now, I, I find this interesting because you this is a new answer today. You've changed your answers all over the map on this. And it looks like to me, you just don't want to answer the question. Two days ago, two days ago, you were asked about this in the House Homeland Security Committee. I've got the transcript right here in front of me. You were asked the same question. Jose Ibarra, why was he paroled? You said, I don't know. You said, I don't know. I don't have the case details with me today. Congressman Bishop says, you don't know. And you said, I don't know. I don't have the details with respect to that individual's case, but I would be pleased to provide them to you, Congressman. You didn't know two days ago. Now, interestingly, on April the 10th, six days before that, you gave Senator Katie Britt a different answer. She asked you the same question. She said, why was Jose Ibera paroled into the United States? You said, and I quote, ranking member Britt, there was no derogatory information of which we were aware. So you were happy to comment on the case then on April the 10th. By April the 16th, you had developed amnesia. And today you say you just won't comment. Now, this is so satisfying for me, and I hope it's satisfying for you, too. Because for years now, I have lamented the fact that Republicans are pretty lousy at questioning witnesses, uh, whether they're pontificating and just delivering a speech or they're just asking stupid open-ended questions that allows the witness to meander and filibuster and not get to the point. It's been incredibly frustrating. It's also frustrating when they don't coordinate and work together. So that when their time is up, somebody else can pick up where they left off. You know what I'm saying? But here we've got Josh Hawley, Senator from Missouri, former Attorney General, I believe, and a lawyer, clearly, who did his homework, had the receipts, and was prepared for his lies. Well, that's funny, because a week ago you were asked the same question in the House, and you said this. Now what's the deal? Now you're giving us a now you say you won't comment on it because it'll disrupt the investigation. So were you lying last week or are you lying now? Or were you lying both times? Thank you, Josh. And it gets even better. But isn't this nice to see? Isn't it cathartic? Finally, you know, I think I've said this before. You know how you know you like Josh Holly? 
and why you should like Josh Holly because all the right people hate him. Josh Holly is mercilessly mocked by all of the elites in Washington, the Jake Tappers and the George Stephanopoulos and the Rachel Maddows and all of the media types and and never Trumpers like Jonah Goldberg and Steve Hayes. You know, they, they oh, that Josh Holly, he's just... Blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that tells me he's probably a regular dude who's just trying to do the right thing. And then he has a moment like this and he brings it. He absolutely brings it. And he brought more. Take a look. So which is it, Mr. Secretary? Now that we have the file, I'll tell you what the difference is. Congressman Bishop didn't have the profile. And Senator Britt didn't have the parole file. And now we do have the parole file. And now we all know that the reason he was paroled into this country was because lack of detention capacity, which, as you and I both know, is not a valid reason under the statute. And now that we know that for sure, this is right out of the parole file. Here it is. Subject was paroled due to detention capacity at the Central Processing Center in El Paso, Texas. Now, suddenly, you don't want to talk about it. This is extraordinary. It's also a pattern with you. So let me just try one more time. Have you read the parole file? Senator, I'm going to give the same answer. And, and let me say. Well, which one? Are you going to give me, me the answer you gave to Senator Britt? Or are you going to give the answer you gave to Congressman Bishop or the answer you gave to Senator Paul? Or do you want to try a fourth one? Senator, I, I will not speak to the particulars of the case, uh, given the pending criminal prosecution. Yeah, well, I'm sure. Well, you certainly of course you don't want to, because it is an absolutely damning indictment of your policies. Let's just review Jose Barrera and how Ibarra rather and how he came to be here. On September the 8th, 2022, he was encountered by United States Border Patrol in El Paso, Texas, and was paroled into the United States due to lack of detention capacity. A provision, a proviso, a rule that is not permitted under the statute. You and I both know you know this. You knew it when you were talking to Congressman Bishop. You knew it when you were testifying to Senator Britt, and you know it today. You just never wanted to cop to it because the statute doesn't permit it. And so you lied to Congressman Bishop and you lied to Senator Britt. And now you are hiding behind the ongoing prosecution excuse because it's the last one left to you because you testified falsely under oath. Then on July 19th, 2023, Ibarra reports for a biometric appointment and was fingerprinted. This is now in New York. The results come back and indicate he has a criminal history. So he's in this country. He has a criminal history. September 14th, he is arrested in New York by NYPD for what? Injuring a child. September 14th, 2023, he is arrested for injuring a child. What happens? The offense was never prosecuted and the arrest was expunged. I'm reading right out of the profile. Expunged. Nothing is done to this guy. He had a criminal record to start with. He's in the country on illegal grounds. You have falsely and illegally allowed him in. He commits a crime against a child. He's not prosecuted. It's expunged. In November, get this, in November, Ibarra files an application for employment authorization. And unbelievably, on December the 9th, 2023, it's approved. So this is your policies in action, Mr. Secretary. A criminal is permitted into this country on grounds flatly not permitted, flatly contradictory to the statute. He commits a crime against a child, and then he gets a work permit. He gets a work permit. You want to know why all of the jobs in the last two or three years have gone to illegal migrants? Working people in this country can't get a job. Their unemployment rate's high. Why? Because of things like this. And then what's he do? Well, we all know that in February, he commits the heinous crime against Lake and Riley. Is yeah, and I, I'd love for him, to, uh, my orcas, to try to jump in there and say, Oh, before you go on, let me just express my deep, deep concern and regret and my uh, heartfelt prayers for the family of Lake and Riley. Oh, shove it up your butt. And, and everything that Holly just detailed there, every single detail about how Lake and Riley was murdered because of this man's policies and the president's policies and the Democrat Party's policies, all of those things he has denied and lied about under oath for three years. All of those things are a violation of the current law that he doesn't make. His job isn't to make immigration law, national security, and border policy law. His job is to enforce it. It's the House and the Senate that makes the law. He's in violation of those laws, and then he lies about it when he's called out on it. And that's why the impeachment articles were voted on and approved. That's why the Senate was supposed to take up impeachment. Every single thing you heard from Hawley just now about why this guy and his violation of the law led to the murder of Lake and Riley 
Democrats yesterday said, yep, we're fine with it. In fact, we're so fine with it, we're not even going to hear testimony or evidence or an argument made so then we can stand up with the pair of cojones that good God gave us and actually show our people in our states how we're going to vote yes or no on the impeachment. We're just going to table it. If they love Mallorca so much, why not call the question? Right now, let's have the trial. Show us how great he is. This is a great opportunity for Democrats in the Senate to show how wonderful Mayorkas is, how great the border is, how brilliant Joe Biden has been managing our national security and border security, and how awful those MAGA fascists are for bringing the impeachment articles. So if, if that's such a solid political position, let's have the trial. This will be a shining moment. What a great gotcha moment, right? Remember how they said that when, when Clinton was impeached and then he was exonerated, that ended up hurting Republicans in the long run, right? That ended up being a political boomerang. Let's do it again. Bring the band back together, Democrats. But they won't do that, will they? Because they're cowards. Because they know better. They just slunk into their hole yesterday. And they said, no, nope, we're not even going to have the trial. And I cannot wait. God, I cannot wait. I cannot wait for Democrats in the House someday in the future. They'll get the majority back and they will bring impeachment articles, probably against President Barron Trump. And the Republican Senate majority leader will say, hey, guys, remember 2024. Remember. That's time to pay. Remember that boomerang you threw back in 2024? <laughs> That's what you're feeling in your face right now. All right, let's bring it back to Josh Hawley because he finished like a beast. Josh Hawley, beast mode, let's go. Is this a record that you are proud of? Um, uh, Senator, um, you've misstated some facts. I have read from the parole file, which you have said you don't recall, don't have, you miscited. I'm reading from it. It is right here. And I've just, pursuant to the speech and debate clause, I have just read it into the record. And the reason is, you have lied repeatedly to Congress and to the American people about this. They deserve to know. And the only way they're going to know is if I tell them. I've just told them. It's in the record now. I've read it verbatim from the parole file. Verbatim. I just want to know, why did you change your story so often? Why didn't you just answer honestly to Congressman Bishop and Senator Britt? Senator, I am... I am confident that justice will be vindicated in the criminal prosecution of the case. Well, hopefully he'll get more of a trial than you got. Otherwise, there'll be no justice for anyone at all. Let me ask you something else. Travis Wolf, do you know that name? Not off the top of my head. Travis Wolf is a 12-year-old boy from Missouri. This is him. Travis was killed on December 20th, 2023, or I should say he was in a a tragic attack on that night. He died some weeks later, head-on collision. The person driving the vehicle who's now been charged with six criminal counts is Indrina Bracco. Do you know who that is? I do not, but uh, let me um, communicate that I know that all of our hearts break for the family of this young boy who died in that accident. Well, she's an illegal migrant here from Venezuela. Local law enforcement tell me that she was detained briefly at the border in 2023 and then released. And then she commits this crime. Multiple people have been stabbed in O'Fallon, Missouri, by illegal migrants. Mr. Secretary, I know that you think your policies are a success. You've sat right there in that chair and you've told me over and over our policies are working. You're on the record years and years saying that. Maybe they're working for you. Maybe they're working for your political objectives, whatever they may be. I don't know but they're not working for Lake and Riley or Travis Wolf or the people of my state. They are in fact a travesty. What you have done is a travesty. And sir, it is long past time for you to go. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and that right there is exactly why they didn't have the impeachment trial. Because that's the kind of stuff that would be brought out. That's the kind of stuff that would be said. And Democrats would have a day, two days, three days maybe 
of that in the news cycle. It was a brilliant because I guess and the reason I'm saying this right now is because I'm hearing all these people say, oh, well, what are an embarrassment for Republicans? See, what's the point of bringing the impeachment? They should have never done that. Bull. They did exactly the right thing and they should impeach Biden and they should impeach Kamala because she's supposedly the border czar. Make Democrats own this crap. That's called politics. What's the point of impeaching? It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, okay. Well, Pelosi impeached Trump twice and it they she knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. But it certainly works politically, doesn't it? You know, Republicans are going to spend the next 7 months playing defense on abortion because they're so half-assed at how they actually articulate what should be a very easy thing to articulate. We're in favor of not murdering babies before they're born. I don't know why that's so hard. But they're going to be playing defense because every single Democrat running for election this year is going to try to make everything about abortion. And, you know, you got this. You got NPR. You got to get a few handful of things that are a freaking layup, a slam dunk, frankly, politically. Oh, Democrats will just stop us. Good. Let them stop you. Then you take it to the voters. And say, hey, Virginia, Tim Kaine wants six more years. Look what he just did. Tim Kaine thinks that the national security at the border is just fine. Tim Kaine thinks that Alejandro Mayorkas is doing a hell of a job, you know, leading to the murder of Lake and Riley. What do you think, Virginia voters? Do you think Tim Kaine deserves six more years? That's politics. For God's sake, Republicans. It's so easy. Do it again. Keep impeaching them. Because what you just saw from Josh Hawley is exactly what we will keep seeing if you can bring the heat. All right, that's it for today. We will be back next time, though. Thank you for watching. Uh, great to see a lot of new friends in the Rumble chat today. Tell a friend, share this live stream with them. Or, as you know, every afternoon we put up all of the individual segments we do as separate standalone videos and share those as well across all your social media and email them to your parents and your friends. Uh, we've only been doing this video show every day at noon for about six months, and the growth has been tremendous. In fact, Kevin, when did we start doing the live rumble? Because for a while, we just did it to tape, and we wouldn't do it live. And when did when did live rumble start? Like I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Two months uh, ago? I think it was February. Yeah, two months ago. Two months ago, and it's been a, we've had a couple of these live streams with over 50,000, 60,000 views and stuff. It's been phenomenal. Uh, we're still getting the hang of Rumble, but we so much support you. We so much, we so much appreciate and have great gratitude for your support. So thank you for that. See, I do like that to make sure you know that we really are live. We really are live and we don't have a script. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next time. In the meantime, my name's Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. <laughs>